got everything set up, but didn't unmute it, Lori. So. <laughs> That's here, probably safer that way. <laughs> here we go again. Gata in opening the sutra. The Dharma incomparably profound and infinitely subtle is rarely encountered even in millions of ages. Now we see it, hear it, receive and maintain it. May we completely realize the Tathagata's true meaning. Good morning, everyone. Hi. You can hear me okay? Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Jeff, you're saying something, but I can't hear you. Happy birthday. Huh. Hmm. Happy birthday. <laughs> Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Try that Happy again. Birthday. Happy birthday. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody speak up so I know we've got audio. Happy happy, happy birthday. birthday! Happy birthday! Happy birthday! Happy birthday! Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. We don't. Oh, yeah. Okay, hang on. Happy birthday! Happy birthday! Happy birthday! Happy 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 birthday! Happy birthday! Happy 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 birthday! Birthday! I can hear all of you guys. Right? <laughs> we all. <laughs> there we go. There we go. Happy birthday! Happy birthday. We're all saying happy birthday! Happy birthday! Thank you. Thank you. Happy yeah, birthday. I can see mouse moving and bodies moving, but but nothing. Um, we're we're testing out a new mic, so obviously you can hear us. And and you know, let us know how it sounds. It should be higher quality. The bell might have sounded better. Yeah, yeah. sounds good. Okay. Hello, John and family. You guys, do it. Happy birthday from all of us to you. We wish it was our birthday so we could party too. Woo! <laughs> uh oh, we're the ground speaker. Thank you. <laughs> well, it makes for a for a for a. For a uh... It's another day in the trenches. <laughs> makes for a, a great birthday morning. Thank you, thank you, everybody, and um, uh, welcome to everyone, and a, a special welcome to Winston. Um, who's showing on the screen as, as Lloyd, but um, Winston joins us uh, for the first time on a Sunday, and uh, he comes to us via Bill Butler, a friend from Yokoji, um, who has been joining us for Don Zazen on Tuesdays and Thursdays. So, Winston. Um, hey, guys. Nice to meet you guys. Hello. Nice to see you. Hi. Nice to see nice you. To see. <laughs> right. Good to see you, and welcome. The family Thank grows. <laughs> All right, so what are we going to do this morning? Um, some of you probably saw the, uh, the newsletter where I told the tale of my father um, pointing out the obvious, which was, you know, before you go ripping the stereo out of the Mustang, perhaps check whether the fuse is blown. And, and of, of course, in the annoying way that fathers sometimes have, he was right, you know? And, and um, so I try as much as possible to look for the simple things and, and stick with the simple things. And, and that's really the, the theme of uh, this morning's talk is the simple thing. And, you know, I think that Zen in a way could be described as the simple thing. And, you know, I'm tempted to say at no time like right now, you know, uh, has it been so important? But I think it's always the case. But, you know, I, I have a number of conversations with people through the week. And um, I would say that, you know, there, it's not an overstatement to say there's a lot of unrest, unease, unsureness, discomfort, disbelief, sometimes a feeling of unhappiness, you know, just kind of circulating around. I mean, there's, there's, um, there's a lot going on and, and a lot of challenges that we have um, right now that, that feel different, but 
you know, I, I, I hesitate like Sunday after Sunday after Sunday to go pandemic, 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 you know, because I mean, in, in a way, let's, you know, reverse, take, you know, take the time machine backwards before the pandemic. Isn't this part of the human condition? You know, I mean, isn't this what Buddha was about, you know, 2,600 years ago? You know, why is there so much old age, suffering, illness, death, you know, how do we break this cycle? And, you know, he, he took a number of years and finally sat down in a cushion like many of us are sitting right now to try to try to pierce through that. So pandemic, yes. And, you know, human life, yes. And as I wrote down this list of words that, you know, unrest, unease, unsureness, unfulfilled, discomfort, right? I, I, it struck me that a lot of our practice is, is just kind of cutting off the un and cutting off the dis because, you know, it's ease, unease, happy, unhappy, comfort, discomfort. And so if you think of Zazen and Zen as, as just shaving off that un, you know, shaving off the dis and, and revealing that natural state of ease and happiness and fulfillment and comfort. That's, that's you know, maybe just a really simple way of looking at, at what we're up to, you know, Take, taking away what it is that creates the un and the dis. Now, I think it's, it's funny because I was sitting and going, well, do we ever put un in front of un things, like un un? And I think there, there are a, a few like unshaken, you know? So it, it's not a strict formula, but I think a nice way to look at it. And then in um, visiting this, I did want to work with a koan uh, it's case 40 from the Moomin Khan. Bodhidharma puts the mind to rest because really this is the central question of this koan is master, I cannot put my mind to rest. Please help me. Okay, that's a shorthand on, on this koan. So I think any one of us could go, oh, please, can I just sleep through the night? You know, or can I stop worrying about this problem? Or why is my life feel so unsettled right now? Can you help me? Can you help me? And so we show up in a Zen center or a church or a self-help group or wherever we go to, to get this help. Uh, the koan is case 41, sorry. Bodhidharma sat facing the wall. The second patriarch standing in the snow. I think everybody here is senior enough, you know, cut off his arm and said, your disciples mind is not yet at peace. I beg you master, give it rest. Bodhidharma said, bring your mind to me and I will put it to rest. The patriarch said, I have searched for the mind but have never been able to find it. Bodhidharma said, I have finished putting it to rest for you. Okay, so what, what's in this koan? Um, there's commentary and verse, which if we have time, I will um, come back to. You know, Bodhidharma sat facing the wall. Okay, this is practice at its most basic. You know, sit down and do zazen. Um, traditionally, this has often been done facing the wall, and I know a number of us have done that in the past. Um, in in more recent times, in in most zendos, um, we just sit facing inward and and uh, face being a community together. But um, facing the wall is an ancient practice. It's another form of nothing there, other than what is going on here, right? There's, there's no stream or river or person across from you to um, 
pay attention to. Um, Bodhidharma, when he came uh, from India to China, and he's called the first patriarch of China, okay? Um, he was the 28th, I believe, patriarch or the 28th ancestor of Shakyamuni Buddha, you know, the Buddha. Um, but he was the, the first to bring the practice to China. He came to China and sat facing the wall for nine years. So, um, you know, we say we are all Buddha and we say it is right here in front of us, right under our feet. And then they're sitting facing a wall for nine years. Okay. And then the um, second patriarch or, or Eka, who would become Bodhidharma's successor, shows up outside, you know, where Bodhidharma is facing the wall. And there's a traditional practice of when you want to enter the monastery or when you want to start working with a teacher, when you want to enter the practice is, is a waiting period. Think of it as the uh, cooling off period after buying a car, right? You know, it's like, oh God, I gotta have that. And so the, you know, you're forced to wait outside in the snow to see if you really want it. You know, it'd probably be better if we did that on um, some of our purchases. <laughs> But anyway, so that's what's going on here is Eka is outside waiting in the snow going, I want to know the truth. I want to see the way. I want to walk the way. And Bodhidharma sits there facing the wall, leaves him out there in the snow. Okay. So this commitment to it, it's like not just a shallow, oh, this looks cool nice group of people, you know, oh, I heard Zen, you know, Zen perfumes Zen gardens, you know, Zen this and that, that, that's kind of trending now, hashtag Zen, but no, I'm, I'm willing to sit in the snow, I'm willing to get up in the morning, I want to do the work to see what is really here, and that this is what Eka is doing, and um, I've read just a little bit from Yamada Roshi, because it's interesting, I picked up this koan. This story of the koan happened on December 9th. So uh, let's say four days ago. That, I just thought it was an interesting coincidence. Uh, it was on the evening of the 9th of December that, that Jinko or Eka went to Bodhidharma. Uh, a heavy snow was falling, but Bodhidharma would not allow him to enter the room. He sat there in the falling snow all night. By morning, it had reached his knees. He wanted to know the absolute truth. Seeing this, Bodhidharma had pity on him and asked, what are you asking for standing in the snow? Now, I thought his, interest, his answer here is interesting. In tears, he replied, your reverence, please open the gate of mercy and save all beings. Notice he did not say, save me, but save all beings. And of course, this is the mark of a bodhisattva. And this is where Buddha started, right? Why is there so much suffering in the world? Why is there old age, illness, and death? And remember, Buddha was royalty. You know, not from a material point of view, not a lot of suffering going on there. You know, all of his needs met wealth and well-being how, you know how do i save other people so eka is out there in the snow saying i want the answer to this question i want to walk the way and um as the story goes bodhidharma makes him wait some more and then there's this cutting off of the arm thing you know now i i doubt very seriously that he truly cut off his arm and then Bodhidharma led him into the room, bleeding all over the place. And then they had this conversation about mind at rest. Um, but again, this is a, a story of <coughs> commitment and intention. And it just points to, no, I really want to know this. I really want to know this. So when you, you know, come into the practice and somebody says, Let's work together for a year before we engage in serious koan study. You know, that's, it's a little bit kinder, gentler 
version of this. You know, you're, we're not going to make you have frostbite in the snow or cut off a limb. And John, if your kids are listening, please explain. You know, <laughs> there's no uh, mayhem or uh, bodily disfigurement in in this practice. But it really goes to that question of how much do you want it? How much do you want it? And then my mind is not yet at peace. I beg you, master, give it rest. And so what does the teacher say? The teacher says, well, it's really a master stroke. Bring your mind to me and I'll put it to rest. Now, in the reading in this particular book, it sounds like right away Eka answers, you know, I have searched everywhere and cannot find it. In, in other tellings of this or, or translations of this, he goes away and then comes back and says, I have tried and I have tried, but I cannot find my mind anywhere. And then Bodhidharma says, there, I have put it to rest. So, you know, so what is this about? I love one of the things that um, Yamada Roshi says, he says, this is pointing to, it's like being on a deserted island and looking for someone there. And then this is so much of what happens in our unrest, our unease, our discomfort, our unhappiness is we're, we're searching and we're looking for something and we look all over for it. And we're looking outside of ourselves most notably. It's like being on a deserted island looking for somebody there. You know, there's nobody there, but we, we keep searching and looking and desiring and wanting and expecting. And it is all of these ings, you know, the looking, wanting, searching, expecting, it's all of these ings that we're doing that is the source of the biggest ing of all, suffering. Because frankly, everything is right here. I don't think Andrea is on with us today, but we were, we were talking about this, this, this expectation, this wanting of something else and this expectation of knowing what is going to happen next. And of course, has there ever been a moment exactly like this moment right now? No, because this moment right now or the next moment or the next moment has not happened and then it it continues to happen. So all of this new experience is constantly rolling out in front of us right here, right now. Well, what happens is we have a story of what it's going to be or what it's supposed to be or what we expect it to be. And then the attachment to that story starts creating all of these disses and uns. And this is the fundamental practice of Zazen. This is why we start with counting the breath. This is why when we do instruction, we say, just sit down. Start following your breath. Then start counting your breaths. Now when a thought arises, go back to one. And is it because we want you to count breaths? Is it because we want to enumerate our breaths? No. This is about seeing the brain, seeing the thought, seeing the monkey mind, seeing everything that is conjured up as a thought, moment after moment after moment versus what is actually happening moment after moment after moment. I mean, it's kind of crazy. You, you sit down on a cushion, you stabilize your body, you put your hands in the right position, you close your eyes, you open them a little bit, you start breathing, you start paying attention to your breath, you start counting your breath. And then there's like, at least for me, like there's all this stuff going on. 
all this stuff going on that's not actually going on. It's like this, this never ending spool of film on a camera just going, you know, and often at 2 a.m. You know, or 0053 if you had too many cookies before going to bed. <laughs> you know, I mean, I had I had one of those crazy moments the other night, 0053, right? I, I woke up, blood sugar way up there. And, um, you know, I was certain it was 4.30 and, you know, time to get up for Don Zazen. 0053. And I started thinking about this one little cauliflower plant in our garden that some entity ripped out. And I'm like, well, what is going on? What kind of animal? What kind of, is somebody sneaking in the garden and taking one cauliflower plant? And all of a sudden, it's just like, you know, and, and there goes sleep. The plant's already gone. There's nothing going on down there. It's all made up story and conjecture and, you know, and what am I worried about, you know, losing another cauliflower plant, I guess. And, and we do this. And so some of you have heard me tell the story of when I started my practice 20 years ago or so, probably two years in when I was in advertising and managing lots of people. And it was one of those 2 a.m. Um, moments in the morning and and I couldn't sleep and you get angry when you can't sleep. And then so you get ang the angrier you get, the more you can't sleep. And all of a sudden the practice kicked in. Remember this, the practice kicked in and I look over and Lori's sleeping and the dog, Steinbeck was our dog at the time, was sleeping. And Nick, who was young, was sleeping. And I wasn't on email and I wasn't on phone with Paris or London who didn't like me very much at that moment. And I, all of a sudden I had a realization that nothing was happening. Nothing was happening at all except for what was going on in my mind. And then the practice allowed me to go, oh, back to one, back to one. And, you know, I tried to persist a little while longer, but eventually you go back to one long enough you start seeing the gaps between the thoughts and in the gaps between the mind doing that storytelling, in the gaps is the big space of no on and no dis, right? This is a space of no story. And so from a very practical point of view, it's really practical. Let's not talk about enlightenment and spirituality, just from a practical point of view. A little bit more peace and a little bit more sleep. But why nine years? Why a year? Why 20 years? Why 40 years? If this is all self-evident, if this is who we are, why all this effort? And this is where the notion of practice comes in because we practice that state of peace. We practice the state of joy. We practice the state of not knowing and not storytelling. And so day after day and year after year, I sit down on the cushion and practice as best I can the degree of understanding and realization that I have. And that's what's there for all of us is practicing the perfection. Lori found a piece this morning. Um, I'm not sure where she found it, um, but it's from Thich Nhat Hanh. And it does a beautiful job of saying this. So, Laurie, you want to read it? Sure. <clears throat> we spend a lot of time looking for happiness when the world right around us is full of wonder. To be alive and walk on the earth is a miracle, and yet most of us are running as if there were some better place to go. Um, there is beauty calling to us every day, every hour, but we're rarely in a position to listen and hear it. 
The basic condition for us is to be able to hear the call of beauty and respond to it is silence. <clears throat> if we don't have silence in ourselves, if our mind, our body are full of noise, then we can't hear beauty's call. Mindfulness is the practice that quiets the noise inside of us. Without mindfulness, we can be pulled away by many things. Sometimes we are pulled away by regret and sorrow concerning the past. We revisit old memories and experiences only to suffer again and again the pain we've already experienced. It's easy to get caught in the prison of the past and the future, the idea of the future actually, I would add. We may also get pulled, oh, that's what he goes on to say. We may also get pulled away by the future. Anxiety, fear, and uncertainty about future events prevent us from hearing the call of happiness. So the future becomes a kind of present too. Mindfulness is often described as a bell that reminds us to stop and silently listen. We follow our breath, making space for silence. This is from um, Silence, the Power of Quiet in a World Full of Noise by Thich Nhat Hanh. Thanks, Lori. Sure. So I thought it was just a, a beautiful, beautifully written piece about silence and how happiness and beauty are right there before us. You know, if only we take the time to sit down and not project forward or replay past what is here right before us. You know, I had a taste of that the first morning in Santa Monica Zen Center when I did Zen instruction. I just, I, I saw the folly of believing my mind and believing my thoughts and believing that Dan knew what was going on in an intellectual way. And I've been practicing that, you know, inside ever since. You know, we talked about all the ings, the searching and the looking, you know, there's really a choice. We can continue searching for what is right here, right now, or we can simply practice it. And the, and the choice I make is, is to practice it. Just claim it and practice it. It's not perfect. It's not like a switch that turns anxiety on and off, that turns depression on and off, that, that turns craving and desire on and off, you know, and it always stays off like, oh, I got this done, Buddha, hood. You know, but it is the muscle that gets stronger over time. This thing about thoughts in the mind, I like to think of it as like a bowl full of sloshing water, okay? The picture a bowl full of sloshing water. Here it is, try to stop it. Take that bowl in your hands and actively try to stop the sloshing, all right? That water is gonna go all over the place. So why not instead practice setting the bowl down, sitting ourselves down and letting it all settle? That's the simple thing. That's Zazen. Set that bowl down, let it settle. You know, I don't want to oversimplify, but it's fairly simple. <laughs> you know, I don't want to overpromise, but the promise is here. And, you know, every Sunday with these faces on the screen, especially once I start talking and let you start talking, I see it play out. So, you know, thank you for joining us again on a Sunday. Um, thank you for the happy birthday. Um, and I, you know, love you guys all so much and, and hope this helps. I'm gonna put gallery view back on and open it up for any questions and answers. Case 41 of the Moomin Khan, beautiful little Khan. Please master, put my mind to rest. Can anyone else put your mind to rest for you?
And where the hell is it? <laughs> where, where is it? Set the bowl down. Let it settle. All right. Go, Jeff. I, I just wanted to say uh, that was a really great talk. I really, uh, I really got, um, I just got a lot out of it. I think it's uh, looking at the mind and the, particularly considering like, you know, the thought arises and yet the thought is not me. And uh, the whole notion of the tick, tick, not Han, the, you know, we're essentially experiencing miracle all the time. We're just not, well, our eyes aren't open to see it is really, uh, really profound. Mm -hmm. um, and I just wanted to comment on art and Marsha's teddy bears. I think those are awesome. And I'm a little jealous. Okay. True story. Mm -hmm. Look at all the teddy bears. There's all teddy bears. Um, and oh, also, yes. I, I, yeah. And also, um, uh, I actually have to go because I'm going to go. Uh, I, one of my like three Christmas caroling gigs this year is today. So happy so, birthday. Great to see yeah, you. Yeah. And Jeff, Jeff, thank you. And um, you've been practicing for a number of years. So what do you just arc over the years? What do you see? Um, I, particularly lately, because I, I, I've been sitting every morning um, uh, <laughs> for maybe the last, you know, I, I sit intermittently, but for the last several months, I've just been really like coming back to my practice and, and really making sure first thing I do is to meditate. Um, there's just a, like at this point, I don't know how I did it without sitting. I find that um, settling my mind at the beginning of the day then allows the things that come later in the day to just, they don't, they don't sting as much or I, I see them for what they are where, you know, it's, it's just sort of uh, lets the air out of all the bullshit that goes on in my head <laughs> um, as a result. So, yeah, I definitely, uh, I, I think, my, for me, my practice is all about just recognizing how grateful and appreciative I am to be alive. And when that's not present, then I know that I'm, I'm deluded or there's something I need to express or take responsibility for. That's, that's kind of my practice these days. Yeah. Well said. And, and enjoy the singing. Thanks. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Great to see you guys. All right. Bye-bye. Marsh. Marsh. Yeah, you're, you're, there you thank go. You, thank you for that talk. That was just really awesome because as many years as I've been practicing, it's always welcome to be reminded again. You know, it's, um, it's something that you need community for. You need to keep yourself reminded of this because it's so easy to get distracted and your mind will just take you off on another journey. And uh, so thank you so much for today's talk. I appreciate it. Thank you, Marsh, and, and the teddy bears are great. Um, hey, Galen had a question about the tools in the background. Yeah. I know they're your fathers, but what- My grandfathers, yes. Grandfathers. And mm -hmm. what particular trade? Well, there were multiple tra trades. So there's some farming tools and there's wood cutting tools. He lived in Maine. Um, and he was sort of a multiple jobs kind of person, but there's a wood planes and saws, a couple of saws, and there's a sheep shears and um, grain cutting tools. So <laughs> it's a variety. Beautiful. Thank you. Thanks, Marsh. Hi, Art. <laughs> Yeah, Ken. Good morning, all. Good to see you again and again. Um, a thought just came to me, and I would like to add two lines to the Heart Sutra, and they would be in one ear and out the other, and no in one ear and out the other. 
<laughs> Thanks, Ken. Sweet. <laughs> As with all Dharma talks. <laughs> For sure. How are the rest of you doing? Everybody good? All right. So yeah, thanks for uh, going on this little journey with us. And as Marsh said, and I don't care how long you keep doing this, the, for me, the reminder, you know, the reminder. And, and in this con, I mean, you could spend more time on the con and the verse and all of that, but it's really this, the central point is where, where are you looking and what are you looking for? And, and what is that search versus the practice? You know, beautiful turn with the teacher, right? Bring your mind to me and I'll put it to rest. Mm -hmm. where, where do you find that? And of course, there's both sides of mind here too. There's the, you know, small mind thinking brain thoughts, okay? But if you wanna look at this koan on your own and, and look at it in another sense, there's, there's mind as in full experience of the world around us, right? Where do I begin and end? And when that sense of mind goes out to that degree, then where are you searching and what are you searching for? And then that can remove some of the clinging as well and some of the desire and expectation. Because when your sense of self expands outward to all of the world and the universe and the experience of it, then you know, where, where do you reach to that is not already you? What, what experience can we have that is anything other than what it is? You know, comfort, discomfort. What makes comfort discomfort? An expectation that this right here, right now, should be something different or could be something different. And there's the dis. And the disconnect, <laughs> as Lori says, rather than the connect with the experience. <laughs>